All right, welcome to the Hank Haney Podcast. I am recording here on nofilter.net. You can find the Hank Haney Podcast on iHeartRadio or wherever you get your podcasts as well. You can see a video version either at nofilter.net, which is a phenomenal uh, place to view podcasts, or you can also find my YouTube channel, uh, Hank Haney on YouTube, uh, Hank Haney Podcast. So this is the Masters edition. It's the, it is Masters week. This is the big week. This is the week that the golf season kind of gets kicked off every year. It just kind of feels like this is, this is the beginning of the season, especially if you live up in the north or northeast, like, uh, like I currently am in Chicago area. This is uh, this is the big one. It's the it's it's the Masters. It's the number one major there is. Make no mistake about it. There's four majors: U.S. Open, Open Championship, the Masters, and the PGA. The number one major by far, not even close. Uh, the Masters. It's the one that everybody wants to win, and uh, and they players would love to win any major. But if they could win the one major, it would definitely be the Masters. So. I think in, in, in light of that, that, it's the, that this is my master's podcast, I have to share with you something. So for those of you that are watching this on video, I'm going to show you a little something here. This is a picture that I had framed. This is the, that's the master's clubhouse. And that is the menu right there. Can you believe that? That is the menu of when Marco Mira hosted. And this was, he won in 1998. And he hosted the master's dinner in 1999. He signed this for me, this little, uh, the invitation, and uh, gave it to me. Master's dinner. Let me see what, April 6th, 1999. What did Mark O'Meara have for dinner that day? I was listening, I, I was looking at the John Rahm dinner. He's got this whole Spanish food going. Uh, I couldn't understand anything they were serving, but I understand what Mark served. So Mark had sushi and sashimi. I don't know how he put all this together. A Caesar salad. I think he just picked everything he likes the best. Uh, steak and chicken fajitas. Rice and refried beans. It says served in honor of Mr. Mark O'Meara. And then they had grilled filet mignon, grilled Pacific salmon, and broiled chicken, hot rolls, trio dessert, Twice baked potato, crab cocktail, graber olives, and fresh asparagus, and that was uh, that was Mark's dinner. Pretty cool. And he signed this picture to me. It says, "Hank, thanks for helping me live my dreams. You're the best, Mark O'Meara." That was that's something I'll never forget. Helping somebody live their dreams is uh, that's a dream come true for any coach. And uh, when Mark O'Meara won the Masters in 1998, I'll never forget it. I was uh, I was there for the whole week, and uh, this is a this is a great Masters story right here. So Mark gets done with the first round. I forget what he shot the first round. I think he shot like one over par of the first round, and uh, he, he shoots he shoots the one over par, and he comes off the he missed a, a putt I think on 18. And he, I mean, he might have shot two over par. I don't know, one or two over par. Anyway, so he comes off the green on 18, and he's he's steaming. He's not he's not happy. And and at that point, you know, his friends are around, his wife's around, and it's like, Hank, go talk to Mark. And of course, that's my job. That's what I was going to do. I was going to talk. And I go and talk to Mark. And Mark goes, he said, he goes, I, he said, I can't play with a darn here. I, he, I think he said something a little stronger than that. Okay. Uh, this course gets me, uh, you know, I can't stand this place. Maybe it was, I can't stand this fucking place, something like that. Uh, and I'm like, Mark, Mark, bud. I said, Hey, you, you know, it was a tough day out there. You shot one over par, you know, you're, you're, you're okay. You, you know, you, let's just, I, okay. He goes, okay. What do you mean? I'm okay. He says, I, I couldn't even make a fucking putt from two feet. And I like, it was, of course he was exaggerating. Like he was prone to do a lot. I said, well, let me take a look at your stroke. Let's see, let's see what you're doing. And uh, you know, let's figure it out and we'll go get him tomorrow. And we went over in the putting green 
and uh, I watched him make a couple strokes and, and, and told him told him a little something. I, you know what? I can't remember what it was I told him. I think it was about keeping his eyes more square. His eyes were lined up too much to the right, so I, I kept his head more straight. And, you know, sure enough, he played his way in position. And then on Sunday, uh, I'll never forget, on Sunday, he had a chance. You know, he was, he's still pretty far back, but, he, but at least he was in the vicinity. And his wife uh, came up to me and she said, Hank, she said, uh, don't, don't tell him anything before it tees off. And uh, it just, you know, even if it's even just just tell him, you know, tell him just to keep doing what he's doing or, you know, something to that effect. And I was thinking to myself, what the fuck are you talking about? I mean, uh, you take care of of uh, being the wife. Uh, you take care of the kids and uh, I'll uh, I'll take care of the coaching. OK. And because. As a coach, if there's, you know, like my regret would be I saw something on the range and I didn't say anything. And I, that never happened many times. Matter of fact, I only think of one time in my career that happened when Tiger was playing at the PJ at, the, at Baltusrong. And I was, you know, I'm going back and forth. Should I say something? Should I not say something? Should I say something? Should I not say something? And I ended up not saying something. And the reason I didn't say something is because I, I knew the correction I would give him would maybe eliminate the right ball, but it would maybe put the left ball in play. And the first hole at Baltusrol uh, had out of bounds left. And I'm like, oh, man, I, I tell him that. And he flashes it out of bounds on the first hole and the tournament would be over. Anyway, that was my only regret, not saying something. So so I never I, I never did that with, with Mark. I always I would always tell him. Of things were, and he was expecting me to tell him of something. Like that. But anyway, he he was he was swinging good. He was hitting the ball good, and that just happened. Uh, the last day happened to be his day. The one thing I've always will will say, like to win Augusta, you have to be able. Generally speaking, it's not this. This doesn't happen every year, but generally speaking, you have to make putts on two out of the last three holes, and uh, and, and Mark O'Meara could always make the last putt. Now, like he, he didn't win, you know, he, he didn't win the most amount of tournaments on the PGA Tour, although he did make it to the Hall of Fame uh, and won two major championships in 1998. But the one thing that Mark could always do is he could always finish. But a lot of people didn't didn't realize, and, and, and you know, you got to be kind of a golf historian to know this, but Mark O'Meara had one of the best finishing rates of any player that ever played the PJ Tour. I think, honestly, I think it, it, Jack Nicholas, uh, Tiger Woods, Ben Hogan, and Mark O'Meara is right in that category too, in terms of finishing off a victory when they were on the lead or tied for the lead somewhere on Sunday. Mark's record was absolutely amazing. If he was ever on the lead or tied for lead on Sunday, his win percentage was very, very high, like like up there in the top top five of all time. So uh, he, he, he had a good pairing on Sunday. I'll never forget this. He had a good pairing. He was playing with Fred Couples. And he's good friends with Freddie. They came out on tour at the same time, uh, went to tour school together, and they've been friends for a long time. So, and, and Fred's the kind of guy that if you, when you got to play with Fred, there was going to be a relaxed round. There was going to be a lot of talking. And, you know, for a player like Mark O'Meara, who's one of the nicest guys you'll ever want to meet, uh, that, that's something that, is is an advantage you know you're going playing with a guy out there that's an absolute you know dick uh and you, you know you, there's nobody's talking at all it, it just puts more tension in the whole the whole round anyway it was a great pairing with fred couples and mark ended up you know making uh some good putts made a big big putt i remember on uh on number four the par par three made a bomb there and anyway you know he just got the feeling maybe this could be his day I'll never forget though. I had to. I had to leave the tournament. I had a. I had a uh, clinic, a, a teaching seminar scheduled with uh, Wisconsin PGA. Never forget 1998 Wisconsin PGA. The Monday after the Masters, and the last flight that I could get out out of Atlanta left at such a time that that I guess I didn't. 
wasn't planning that Mark was going to be in the last group, or I figured if he's in the last group, I'll figure it out when I, uh, you know, when the time comes. But I had to leave when he was like on the 16th hole, I think. He was on the 16th hole, and I had to leave the golf course to make it to that commitment that I made in, uh, in Milwaukee. I, my lifelong student, I didn't get to see him finish out the Masters, but I was driving in the car. I'll never forget, driving on, in the car back to the Atlanta airport from Augusta, Georgia, and I'm talking on the uh, phone to my friend uh, David Abbott, and he he is is going through the you know whole round with me the last three holes. You know, a good drive here. He gets a good iron shot. You know, you know, just missed the putt or whatever. And you know, and then and he gets on 18, and uh, Mark hit a good drive and hit it on the green. And David's telling me he's got like 15 foot putt to win the Masters, and and then he goes. And, and, you know, I'm waiting and, we're, you know, he's getting right, he's taking me through the whole thing like he's an announcer and he's, he's getting ready to putt, you know, and and then he, he, he gets a putt. And he, goes, he made it. He made it. He made it. And Dave was a good friend of Mark's and a big fan, too. And he goes, he made it. He made it. You know, I'll never forget it. I mean, it's like the, that was like the, one of the, the coolest moments ever. You know, one of those times when you're, you know, that place and time and it's a lifelong memory. And that was uh, that was one of those uh, uh, from from Augusta. Because somebody, you know, they, they did a, a, a came and did an article. Uh, Gary Van Sickle did an article about me moving back to Chicago for the Chicago District uh, Golf Association magazine. And he asked me, he said, "What are your best Masters memories?" And that was uh, that was number one on my list for sure, right there, uh, because um, to to see a great guy uh fulfill his dreams there's uh there's nothing better than that that was uh that was that was really really cool so uh so that's my little master story to start off the um the the, the master show here and i want to talk about uh who i think is going to win the masters first off here's here's what i always say about who's going to win the masters i always say that I, I'm going to pick the best player. So for years and years and years, when I was coaching Tiger, I would always pick Tiger. I picked Tiger to win every tournament. And I was right about half the time when Tiger would, would win upwards of 50% of his tournaments. So I always pick the best player. It, it, it is such a crapshoot picking. Now, I, I have a pretty good track record picking after a round or after two rounds or three rounds or in the middle of the fourth round, you know, going on one of those betting sites, I, I, I go on there and I'll, I'll make a little money picking who's going to win. Cause I'm, I'm pretty good at predicting that. We'll see what's going on. But to pick a winner before the tournament starts, it's like, like it, it's, it's so hard to do, you know, you don't know how anybody's going to play. You kind of know how they've been playing, but you don't know how they're going to play. Half the guys that you think are going to win or have a chance to win are going to be out of the tournament after one day. Well, the, the TV and the radio and everything, they'll tell you, oh, this guy's still got a chance. You know, he's only he's only two over par and he's a good round tomorrow. But the reality of the, of the situation is, is, is that players that are in the top 10 after the first round, second round, third round, they, they, they win. They win the tournament. And, and the number is really high as players that are top 10 after the first round, somebody in the top 10 after the first round, it, a greatest percentage of the time will end up winning the tournament. So these players that are over par and, and fighting back to get in, and Mark did it, it did it in 1998, Mark O'Meara did, but, but it just doesn't happen very often. It, it, it doesn't. And when you get off to a bad start, you, you're, you're fighting an uphill climb and your margin for error goes down to, to absolute zippo. So it's hard to, it's hard to pick a, you know, a winner. Uh, I always go with the best players and I, the, the best players at the masters this year. I mean, some of the guys aren't going, going great. I mean, Roy McIlroy is one of the best players there. He's going for the career grand slam, but he hasn't played very good all year. I uh, went for an emergency lesson out to Butch Harmon and Butch can work some miracles. So you never know. I mean, I, I, I give him more than no chance for sure, but I, I got to go with Scheffler. I mean, he's a uh, far and away the best player in the world right now with his statistics. It just boils down to his putting. Can he, can he putt well enough, but he has putted well at Augusta and having those memories and knowing the greens 
Uh, that's a big thing. The pins are in the same place every, you know, every year and they're in the same place. I mean, they might throw in one new pin placement, but they ain't going to throw in 10 new pin placements. They're going to be in the same place. You don't know what day they're going to be there, but they're going to be in the same place every year. You know, the four pins, when you walk up on the green, they know the greens, they know the putts, they know where to practice from. And, uh, you know, and you have a history there and Scheffler won the green jacket. Uh, you know, a couple years ago, that's a, you know, he, he's, uh, he's at the top of the list if he, if he puts, but you can say that about, you know, a few players, if he puts uh, the, the next player I'd look at is, is John Rom. Cause these are, these are the best players in the world. Rom's a defending champion. It's hard to go back to back, but Rom's the kind of guy that could do that. I mean, he's just a, he's a quality, quality player and there's, there's no two ways about it. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he's, he's done it before and he can rise to the occasion. And then the third player to me is Brooks Kepka because you can't deny Brooks Kepka's major championship, uh, prowess. I mean, he's just, he's so, he's, he's, he's so good. It's ridiculous. And, uh, he's, he's so good at it. And I, I point back all the time when I'm talking about Kepka to the 2019 masters, which Tiger won and, uh, he, he won it, he won it in a dramatic win, but he won it with one three putt and no penalty shots, the, the, the whole, whole tournament. And you know how I always say the key, the key to golf and the key, the key, this every level of the game, but it, it, the same thing holds true in professional golf. And it will really hold true at the masters is that you have to eliminate three things. You have to eliminate penalty shots, then you eliminate what I call two chips, two chips, two pitches, two sand shots. When you miss a green, you got to get the ball on the green in one shot. And that that those happen at Augusta because you miss a green and you got a tough little chip and you try to get real cute with it and you run it over the green or you leave it short. That happens. And then at Augusta, a big thing is the three putts. You have to you have to eliminate the three putts. And and, and there's a lot more three putts at Augusta than than get counted because they only count the ones that are that are putted from on the green as a putt, but every player in the field that putts from, you know, six inches or a foot off the green and three putts counts it as a three putt. So, and I do too. So you have to, you have to eliminate three putts, penalty shots and two chips. So when Tiger won in 2019, he had one three putt, no penalty shots. If Tiger would have had one three putt in the six years I've taught him, he would have won six Masters championships. He won one master championship in, the, in those six years. He'd have won six of them if he had only one three putt or less in those uh, those those years. But it's hard to do. You're going to have three putts. You're going to have penalty shots. In fact, Brooks Kepka, who finished second to Tiger in 2019, had uh, six three putts and five penalty shots for a total of 11. 11 penalty shots, two chips, and three putts. He had a total of 11. And he lost the tournament by one shot to Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods had one three putt, no penalty shots. Uh, Kepka, that he he had to walk away from that tournament, thinking I totally pissed this tournament away, and uh, this 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 one this green jacket should have been mine, but it wasn't. It was it was it was Tiger. So so this year at the at the Masters, that's what it'll boil down to. It always does. Uh, you know, they'll talk about the iron play and how important that is. And it is, you got, you got to hit your irons, you know, driving is important because you got these par fives, you can get two and two if you get good drives and you know, the Augusta was a lot, uh, you know, tighter than it, than it used to be. They put trees on 11, uh, you know, the, the 17 is a tight hole, it, it, you know, 15 is tighter than it used to be. It, it, it's, it's, it's not as easy of a, of a driving, driving course as maybe it, it, it used to be, especially with the second cut of rough. Uh, but, but the, the big thing is the penalty shots and the, and the three putts, that's a big thing. So the, so the tournament will boil down to this. It will boil down to do the player keep it out of the water on 11, 12, 13, and 15. So those are your four holes, 11, 12, 13. If you take penalty shots somewhere else on the golf course, you're not going to win. The, you're not going to the Masters. You can just take that to the bank. You can book on that. But 11, 12, 13, and 15, those are the key holes. Dump it in the water on 12, not going to win the Masters. Uh, it, it, dump it in the water on 13, maybe you can overcome it because you can still get the ball up and in and make a par. 
Uh, dump it in the water on 15. It's 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 going to be tough. Uh, more than more than a total of two penalty shot, two chips or three putts, and it's very difficult to win uh, at Augusta. Very difficult to win any major championship or any PGA Tour event when you you have a, a high number of penalty shots, two chips and three percent. For a pro, a high number is like one around. That's a, that's a high number. So when you see players that go out there and they three putt a couple times the first day, and uh, maybe they hit it in the water on the second day, and you think, oh, he's right there, he's got a chance. At the end of the at the end of the week, that's going to come back to bite him. Those those uh, penalty shots, two chips and, and three putts. You can you can have a two chip, what, what I would call a two chip on number uh, three, uh, the the uh, the par four, because they'll drive it down close to the green. I'll try to hit a wedge up there. It'll it'll you know, short wedge because it'll be, you know, 30, 40 yards from the green and it'll hit on the front and it'll roll all the way back down the hill. That's a, that's a two chip. So those are the things you look for and those will determine, determine the winners. But uh, all things being equal, I, I, I look at, at Rom, I look at uh, Kepka, and I look at, at Scotty Scheffler. And, and, but, but because there's only three players there, you know, anything can happen. And a lot of players are seemingly not playing and not at the top of their game, like, like uh, Cameron, you know, Smith, uh, you know, I, I don't know how DeChambeau's playing. Uh, Dustin Johnson hasn't played that good this year. He's a guy that plays Augusta really good. Uh, you know, Bubba's a, getting a little up there in age. Uh, Mickelson's probably, you know, uh, probably too old to, to win at Augusta, but I wouldn't, you know, I, I don't put anything by Phil. But, uh, you know, you don't have a lot of players playing great. Rory just has not played great this year. He's, he's somebody that historically is a pretty good good favorite at, at Augusta. But not a lot of guys are, are, are running a heater going into this thing. So you're probably looking at, at uh, one of those first three guys I mentioned, Rom, uh, Scheffler, and, uh, you know, Kepka. Or, or, you know, maybe this is the year. Maybe this is the year. You know, and I, I, I kind of got this little feeling. This could be the year that you see like the surprise winner. Mark Romero was a surprise winner. Uh, Larry Mize was a surprise winner. Uh, Charles Schwartzel was a surprise winner. Uh, you know, Mike Weir was a surprise winner. It happens. And it hadn't happened in quite a while. So this could be the year because it's going to happen. I mean, that's not that, you know, that it's going to happen again. Uh, history keeps repeating itself, and uh, you know, every once in a while, you see somebody win at Augusta that you weren't weren't expecting to. And this this uh, this could be this this is setting up for the perfect year for that to, that to happen. If it's not one of the big guys, it, it'll be uh, it might be somebody that we uh, we we least expect them to win. Guy, a, a first time major winner, something like that. All right, hope everybody enjoyed the podcast. Uh, make sure you check out all the great programming on nofilter.net. Uh, hit the follow button on the iHeartRadio app if you are uh, getting your podcast there, or, or you can find my podcast anywhere that you, you get your podcast. And check out my YouTube uh, channel, the Hank Haney Podcast, on the YouTube, so you can uh, check it out, uh, the video version of it. And uh, I hope everybody has a great week watching the Masters. It is the number one greatest tournament in the world and all the best players well not all the best players they left out a few liv players but most all of the best players are playing and uh golf is in need of that for sure so this is going to be a great great week of golf and the weather looks good so i uh, can't wait for the masters hope everybody has a great great week and enjoy the masters all the best